Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 22nd meeting of 2018. We have apologies from Fulton McGregor, who's rejoining the Justice Committee. Agenda item one is a declaration of interest from um, our new member. And it's my pleasure to welcome Shona Robson to the Justice Committee. Shona, can I ask you to declare any relevant interest? No interest to declare. That's fine. And Liam Kerr, I believe you've got declaration. Yeah, simply because of the subject matter today, uh, I declare that I'm a practicing solicitor and I hold current practicing certificates in England and Wales and Scotland. Thank you. Agenda item number two is a decision on taking three items in private. Are we all agreed to take item five, which is consideration of our approach to scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2019-20 uh, in private? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Are we all agreed to take item six, which is consideration of a draft report on alternative dispute resolution in private today and at any future meetings? Agreed. Thank you. And are we all agreed to take item seven, which is consideration of a draft report on professional legal education in private today and at any future meetings? Agreed. Thank you for that. Agenda item three is an evidence session on the impact of Brexit on the civil and criminal justice system and policing in Scotland. And I welcome Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and congratulate him on his new appointment. We look forward to your many appearances before the Justice Committee in the future. Um, today, the Cabinet Secretary is accompanied by his officials, Linda Hamilton, Deputy Director of Defence, Security and Cyber Resilience Division, and Gavin Henderson, Deputy Director of Civil Law and Legal System Division, Scottish Government. I also welcome the Lord Advocate James Wolfe, QC, and Helen Nisbet, Head of International Cooperation with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. I refer members to Paper 1, which is a private paper, and I understand both the Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate wish to make a short opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, uh, and good morning to you and the committee. Many thanks uh, for your kind words uh, there, and I notice the emphasis on many appearances before the Justice Committee, to which I uh, look forward to. Uh, Convener, we are now less than 200 days from the day on which the UK seems destined to leave the European Union. At this late stage, it is deeply concerning that the UK Government do not know what the future relationship with the EU on justice matters will be. The lack of clarity and detail from the UK government in relation to negotiations with the EU presents us with considerable challenges. However regrettable the position we find ourselves in, the Scottish government and Scotland's operational partners, such as Police Scotland and the Crown Office, will continue to make responsible preparations for all exit possibilities. Uh, planning is well underway to prepare for an unfathomable no-deal scenario. Uh, the committee will be aware of the paper we published in June on Scotland's place in Europe, security, judicial cooperation and law enforcement. Uh, as our paper demonstrates, Scotland greatly benefits from existing security, law enforcement and criminal justice cooperation with the EU. It underlines the importance of how these measures work together in fighting crime and keeping people safe. <coughs> Anything other than full membership and participation in these measures will mean a loss of capability. Uh, measures such as ECRIS, the European Criminal Records Information System, the Schengen Information 2 system, uh, the alert system for, for missing or wanted persons and the European arrest warrant, they're all effective in ensuring those accused of crime can swiftly be brought to trial. In some cases, a European arrest warrant has resulted in an arrest being made within five hours. The prospect of losing civil judicial cooperation also presents some real challenges. Reciprocal civil justice measures like cross-border recognition of contracts and civil orders assist businesses, assist families and individuals by providing certainty across borders about what laws apply in different jurisdictions. The Scottish Government shares the aim of having a close relationship with the EU in relation to security, law enforcement and civil judicial cooperation. It is critical that the UK Government negotiates a future relationship with the EU which takes account of Scotland's separate legal system, uh, the independent role of the Lord Advocate, and maintains the direct links which our justice agencies have with the EU. Uh, given the level of engagement from the UK has not always been consistent or meaningful, I hope the acknowledgement of all these points in the UK government's white paper in July signals a willingness to protect and promote Scotland's independent system 
amid negotiations. Uh, to conclude, uh, convener, we remain committed to, uh, to working with our partners to prepare for the risks involved in losing access to EU justice measures. We will build on existing strong links we have within Europe to demonstrate Scotland's desire to collaborate on justice issues for the benefit of our citizens. Thank you, Lord Advocate. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, and perhaps I could just make a few preliminary points from the perspective of my responsibilities in relation to the investigation and prosecution of crime and the associated responsibilities which I have in relation to extradition and mutual legal assistance. Um, the first point is to uh, stress the operational importance of mechanisms for cross-border cooperation in the criminal justice field. Uh, some of the most serious crimes with which we deal have a transnational element, serious organised crime, human trafficking, trafficking in illicit goods uh, and cybercrime. Uh, and the second point against that background is to make the uh, point that Scottish criminal justice agencies, both the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and Police Scotland, cooperate with their counterparts in many other jurisdictions uh, uh, across the globe. Uh, what's uh, special about the e EU is that within the EU we benefit from a particularly effective legal regime and a suite of effective and practical arrangements which facilitate and underpin uh, cooperation in the field of criminal justice. And I don't think it is controversial to observe that leaving the EU without replacing that regime would significantly and adversely affect uh, our capabilities. Uh, so from a professional criminal justice point of view, the realistic issue is the extent to which those detriments uh, can be and will be uh, mitigated. And in thinking about that, it's helpful uh, perhaps to distinguish between withdrawal, uh, what will happen uh, next March, uh, and the future relationship. Um, the draft withdrawal agreement which the United Kingdom government has been negotiating with the EU and which is, uh, uh, has been published envisages that we will continue until December 2020 to maintain, broadly speaking, the current arrangements. Although there will be some uh, detriments from our current position, for example, in the potential for other member states uh, to uh, not to extradite their own nationals to the UK uh, after March of 2019. Uh, of course, if there is no withdrawal agreement, um, then uh, the UK would immediately lose upon leaving the EU the benefit of the current arrangements, and there would be an immediate and significant impact on operational capabilities. If one turns to the future relationship, um, if the uh, anticipated or um, uh, 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 the, the withdrawal agreement which is under negotiation is entered into, uh, that will provide time for the UK government to negotiate on the future relationship between the UK and the EU. Uh, and the committee will have seen the UK government's ambitious proposal for a future criminal justice and security relationship, which would be significantly more far-reaching than any, other, any current arrangement in this field between the EU and a third country. Uh, and I hope that as um, we proceed to negotiation of the future relationships, uh, all parties will focus on the practical imperative of putting arrangements in place which will enable us to continue to protect uh, our citizens from uh, crime and harm. Thank you both for these opening statements. We now move to questions and can I start with a key theme, theme which is the, the benefits and costs of leaving the EU justice regime. You both touched on that, um, but could we more specifically have some details of the things that um, the UK and Scotland could perhaps do differently after Brexit? Well, I'm happy to speak uh, first. Uh, convener, I think it's worth making the point and, and stating the point that any dilution of the arrangements that we have currently, any stepping back from that or moving away from that is going to be to the detriment of justice and justice capability, full stop. And some of that was touched upon in Lord Advocate's statement, I think, in, in, in my statement uh, also. Uh, there will be some serious areas 
of risk. The European uh, arrest warrant perhaps being one of the most obvious examples where, as I said in my statement, some criminals have been arrested within five hours of a European arrest warrant. Uh, in terms of criminal records, in terms of uh, civil matters in relation to divorce, to child maintenance, there are huge areas uh, of risk. Uh, I think if I got your question correct, you asked around whether or not there's an opportunity to do things differently. Uh, in, all, in, in a number of these matters, there may well be fallbacks. So, for example, the Hague Convention may be a fallback in relation to some uh, civil matters when it comes to uh, European arrest warrant and not having access to European arrest warrant. We may be able to go into previous uh, uh, precedents of legislation, whether that's extradition treaties and so on and so forth. But none of them are an adequate replacement for the arrangements we currently have. Perhaps I could just um, <clears throat> add, if I may, um, it's important to keep in mind that we're dealing here with uh, mutual cooperation um, by its nature. This is not something that we can do on our own. Um, the essence of criminal justice cooperation um, are cr across boundaries, across jurisdictional boundaries, um, it is that um, uh, um, both parties need to be willing to cooperate and have agreed the rules upon which they're willing to cooperate. Now, as I said in my remarks, we cooperate with our counterparts across the world under a variety of arrangements. Um, what is markedly um, true about our, the position in relation to the EU is that we have a set of practical arrangements for, for cooperation like Europol and Eurojust, and we also have a legal regime that underpins cooperation, such as the arrest warrant regime and the investigation order regime, um, which um, uh, uh, enable us to cooperate with our counterparts in a particularly uh, effective way. And from the policing perspective, of course, there's the uh, uh, very important um, set of arrangements for exchange of data um, uh, in the criminal justice field. Um, now, we can't... We can't replace that unilaterally. So if the question is, could we do things differently? Well, um, insofar as it's, um, uh, uh, we want to cooperate with our counterparts in other jurisdictions, we can't cooperate um, on a basis that they're not willing to uh, uh, agree to cooperate with us on. Um, so uh, ultimately, um, it's going to be all about what can be agreed what, what the UK will agree with the EU, what the EU will agree with the UK uh, about uh, the future arrangements. Yes, that, that's helpful. Um, I, I think you've both concentrated maybe on uh, some of the, the areas where problems and, and probably disadvantages could occur. And I wonder if, if I could ask you if you're both encouraged that Michel Barnier only yesterday said that he thought there was a lot of common ground and security issues and that many of um, points of convergence, particularly on defence and security, exist between the EU and the UK. So are there, are there anywhere that you see opportunities to, to build on this, perhaps even for a better session, if we, we look at our glass half full as opposed to half empty? Convener, I, I am an eternal optimist, I, I promise you. But where I get concern is, on the one hand, yes, absolutely correct to say, uh, reference uh, Michelle Barney's comments. Uh, on the other hand, the EU has been absolutely explicit that with a quote-unquote third country, there cannot be the same cooperation or the same access as you would have as an EU member. And let's please not be around the bush that any detriment to the current arrangements in relation to the European arrest warrant, to Europol, to Eurojust and many other measures, any detriment to that, there is only one set of people that will benefit from that, and that will be those criminals that are on the run hopping from country to country across the European continent. Nobody else will benefit from any looser arrangements. Yes, as the Lord Advocate uh, articulated uh, expertly, uh, there is uh, opportunity to, to, to perhaps do things uh, in a different way, but that will involve cooperation uh, between the two. Now, from my perspective, when I, when I, when I was watching uh, and reading over the transcript of the Secretary of State for Scotland here at the Justice Committee uh, last week, uh, where I would associate myself uh, with his remarks is, yes, we want to have as close cooperation as possible. But from our perspective and the Scottish Government's perspective, 
uh, clearly uh, we would like to see arrangements as, uh, as much as they can be uh, similar to, 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 to what we have. In fact, uh, uh, we wouldn't want any detriment to that because of the reasons that I've pointed out here. Uh, it would also, of course, require the EU uh, to, 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 to show some movement, and, and I've not seen too much, uh, I have to say, uh, I have not seen too much evidence of, of that thus far. Lord Advocate. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right to point out that there is um, a, a level of convergence on strategic aims in, in this area, um, and indeed that's been apparent over uh, <coughs> uh, 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 some period. I think, I think the question mark is um, um, how that convergence on strategic aims um, will translate into detailed provision in a way which, on the one hand, reflects the decision of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, Secondly, which fulfills any requirements of the European Union legal order and which also meets our collective responsibilities on all sides uh, to keep our citizens safe. Um, uh, for my part, uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, I, I hope that um, all parties will keep uh, clearly in their mind the practical imperative of making arrangements which will continue to protect our citizens from harm and from crime. And if, if the outcome is, is, is a, 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 a partnership, an arrangement of the sort that the UK has uh, outlined, uh, that would be uh, a satisfactory outcome. Um, I suppose at this point, uh, that's in the, in, in, in the future. As you say, the state-sponsored terrorism, you know, is just as likely to happen in the EU state as it is in the UK. So there is some um, obvious uh, sense in cooperation and being very much aware of that. Supplementary, Rona. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, when the Secretary of State for Scotland gave evidence last week, I asked him about the cost to Scotland of... Um, us leaving the EU justice regime. He said, I'm not aware that the Scottish Government has identified a specific issue in relation to policing for which it would require additional funding. Um, can you maybe give me um, your opinion of that um, in terms of, it seemed clear that the Secretary of State was saying there would be no more money for Scotland to deal with perhaps extra border security costs, etc. Could you maybe give me um, your impression of that? I note and I've read the transcripts of the <clears throat> various evidence sessions that the committee has, has, has held in, in relation to this topic with, uh, uh, with those involved in justice. Uh, and, and it would be fair to say without putting words in, in their mouth at all from actually reading the transcripts that that certainly wouldn't be their view um, and, and other partners' view. That, uh, and we saw recent comments from uh, the PSNI uh, over the weekend uh, and last week uh, as well to the cost uh, to their service. So... Uh, I believe Mr Russell is obviously making a statement later on to, to Parliament today. I expect him to cover in more detail uh, some of the finances uh, and the financial aspects uh, of this. But, uh, you know, clearly uh, there are some areas that are reserved and you touch upon borders and uh, so on and so forth. But clearly in the justice portfolio, uh, many issues, uh, as, as you know, uh, are, are devolved. So uh, we have to ensure that uh, for that uh, there's adequate funding. Uh, but what is imperative is that we get some detail on what the deal will be on withdrawal. Once we get the detail, uh, no doubt ourselves as a government, but also our justice partners, uh, will be able to, to elaborate more on the costs involved. Thank you. Lord Advocate. Um, I don't think there's anything that I can uh, usefully add other than to observe that, um, um, as the committee is aware, um, uh, Additional funding was recently made available to the Crown Office of Procurator Fiscal Service in year, and, I, uh, and a, 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 a small part of that funding is being applied to um, additional resources um, uh, to supplement the um, uh, supplement uh, Helen Nisbet's team um, in dealing with um, Brexit, um, particularly um, over the next period when uh, it may be that there will be a requirement for. Uh, uh, more intensive work than uh, a, a more intensive uh, work and engagement with a range of, uh, of our counterparts. Thank you. Daniel. Thank you very much. And good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate. Um, I mean, I think when people listen to the Brexit debate, it's very much trade and economic matters that dominate. But I think when you listen to the issues here in terms of 
protecting our citizens, uh, access to information that would make our agencies effective, and also ensuring that our law has reach, especially given the increasingly international aspect of, of crime in this day and age. I think you realise that actually the, 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 the impact of Brexit goes far beyond simply economic matters. I was just wondering if, if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with that. And, and if so, and I hear uh, what he was saying in his earlier comments about having full access uh, to the, the some, I think, 40 measures which are set out in the UK government uh, paper. Uh, it's easy to say, you know, act full access and or indeed, you know, a full legally binding agreement, which is, I think, the language in the, in the UK government's white paper. But there's an awful lot of complexity that lies beneath that. What, what would have to be put in place to achieve that full access or full legally binding agreement, uh, in your view? I'll come to the first point and then try to address some of the second point uh, where I can. I think you're absolutely right, and Daniel Johnson is right in this, that the justice measures, we talk about criminal matters a lot, and I think that's important, and, and, and I've touched upon one or two examples, quite high-profile cases that members around uh, the table, but also the general public, will be aware of, and how justice was uh, swiftly uh, served because of our European cooperation. There's many examples of that. I can give literally hundreds if you wanted uh, to, to, to do so, but I'll, I'll spare you. So many, many examples. But also on the civil side of things, which makes it real to people, um, when it comes to recognition of divorces, when it comes to child maintenance, or if you're a business owner that does business across Europe in terms of contractual law, procurement law, uh, the recognition of that in, in, in jurisdictions and so on and so forth, all of these are matters that could feasibly uh, affect people in their, in, in, in their everyday uh, lives. Uh, he's absolutely right around some of the, the, the complexity. I suppose the, the, the positive, of course, is that we're not a third country coming in from, from the outside. We are obviously, obviously a, a member state that has those links built in. We have, for example, if I took just one example, uh, Police Scotland have uh, an embedded officer within Europol. So therefore we have the structures in place uh, and I suppose our plea to the UK government and in fairness to the European uh, Union negotiating partners uh, would be that retaining all of that, if not uh, as much as that, if not all of that, uh, would be hugely desirable um, for justice to be served as swiftly as it currently is. I don't know whether on that my officials want to add anything more in terms of the, the kind of complexity but it, or, or any other examples of, um, of, uh, of, of how we're already embedded. But those structures already very much exist and I would hope that it wouldn't be too complex to, to, to necessarily attain them. But clearly this is a matter of negotiation. I think the other part of what you were asking about was the actual mechanism. Um, and the mechanism effectively is up to the UK and the EU to decide. So there's been discussion about a security treaty um, and whether that is a mechanism um, for going forward or something that falls uh, less than that. But that is effectively part of the negotiation between the UK and the EU. Um, and um, from the Scottish Government's perspective, as long as as many of these measures are protected um, as possible, then um, that is what we would uh, hope to see. And that's a very useful point because I mean I think one of the things that frustrates me is that we, we often talk in euphemisms in the in, through the, the Brexit debate and we talk about full legal agreements. I mean ultimately what we're talking about is that there will need to be some sort of bilateral treaty in order to establish the mechanisms which are required. Given that there is some 40 mechanisms which are within the scope of this, uh, do we have sufficient time or what sort of you know, complexity would be involved in establishing such a treaty, given that we have, as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out, less than 200 days before Brexit date, and possibly a transition period beyond that, but probably that will extend to not much more than 18 months beyond those uh, less than 200 days. I mean, in, I mean are there comparisons in, in terms of other treaty negotiation processes that we can learn lessons from? Is there sufficient time? How complex a treaty does the Scottish Government feel that, that, that this may be? one of the, the difficulties in answering your question and, and absolutely the correct question to, 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 to certainly be asking and uh, I would say time is critical but the difficulty in answering the question is where there is a gap and, and a lack of information coming from the UK government on matters that are reserved to it so extradition European arrest warrant these big big meaty issues uh, of which we have little detail quite heavy on aspiration 
but very light on detail. So a lot of aspiration from, and we saw that from the Secretary of State for Scotland. And I, I commend that aspiration. I think it's good to, to, to go in with that aspiration, but really light on detail. And until we have that, uh, if we were planning on the absolute worst case scenario as we are doing, and it's prudent for us as a government to do an unfathomable no deal scenario, then having less than 200 days uh, to, 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 to have everything uh, tied up by then uh, is, is a very big ask indeed. Can I just ask one final question? Uh, in this? Sorry, Lord Advocate. So I wonder if I might just uh, uh, make a couple of points. Um, uh, I think the key point is that whatever arrangement is put in place will be a matter of, uh, as you rightly observe, international, an international treaty between the UK and the EU, potentially the other member states uh, as well. Um, if you look at the uh, draft withdrawal agreement, which is currently under negotiation, which, uh, and, uh, which is, is available uh, publicly, the section on criminal justice is, is actually quite short because it simply um, identifies the legal instruments to which we will continue to be party during the period, transition period that's envisaged in that withdrawal agreement, and then identifies certain limits and constraints um, on uh, our continued, uh, or, or, or on our continued involvement in the legal regime. Um, so that's a relatively short uh, instrument. Um, uh, what the international treaty, the, the security treaty that um, has been um, proposed by the UK will ultimately look like will, is perhaps quite a different question. Um, it's obviously for others to negotiate that international treaty. Um, from an operational perspective, what one would be looking for would be um, participation in a legal regime that is equivalent to what we currently have. And it's very important to keep in mind in this area that you know, while there's, I, I would anticipate, a great deal of goodwill in terms of cooperation across borders between criminal justice agencies, because we're dealing with the rights of individuals, suspects and people accused of crime, um, you need a legal regime in place that uh, is effective. So the legal instruments have to be there. Um, participation in institutional structures that facilitate cooperation and um, from the operational perspective access to, to data. Um, and uh, one of the, um, uh, I think one of the challenging issues may, may be, but really important issues, is how we continue to participate in a regime which is itself dynamic. You know, we tend to look at the current suite of 40 instruments and take that as a snapshot uh, of things that we would like to keep. And the UK and Scottish Government and, and myself, I think, all recognise that this is a suite of arrangements that fit together, that work together, and that if you pick away at it, if you're part of only, uh, have an, if you're only in part of it, then it's not as effective as the whole. I think we also need to recognise that uh, within the EU, it is also a dynamic regime where um, uh, which itself continues to develop and where the United Kingdom has been uh, a leading player in terms of developing the regime. I think the trick from the perspective of, of a future agreement, the challenge perhaps uh, uh, is how, uh, whether or not and to what extent and how we're able to continue to participate in the regime as it continues to develop and to make our own contribution to that development. So just one final question. I mean, I think uh, 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 in, in terms of getting that agreement right, the starting point is, is very critical. And therefore, the, the white paper that's been published, I was just wondering uh, what the Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate's view what was in terms of that as a starting point. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the lack of detail, but I was also wondering whether or not you thought it, the scope was correct. Does it identify the correct issues? Are there any sort of thoughts or commentary you have on it as a starting point? Yeah, so I think my, my opening remarks hopefully alluded to the fact that, um, you know, there were some areas uh, within uh, the white paper and within some of what's been published by the UK government that, that, that I see uh, positive. For example, they've clearly taken heed of what we've been saying to them for, for, for uh, quite some time around Scotland, uh, recognising Scotland's separate legal system, the independent role of the, the, the Lord Advocate and, and, and of course, maintaining uh, direct links, our own direct links uh, with justice agencies, uh, our justice agencies with the EU, for example, the, the, the Police Scotland, Europol uh, tie-in that, that we already have. 
Um, we also published, as, as I mentioned, that, that our, our, our paper scones place in, in, in Europe, uh, which uh, was far more substantial than, than anything that was within the UK government's paper. But I did recognise what the Secretary of State for Scotland did have to say last week, which was that um, some further technical notices would be imminent. Uh, it would be fair to say that um, the engagement uh, on justice matters has, has been mixed. I would say with the Ministry of Justice, um, my officials have had relatively positive uh, discussions. Uh, with the Home Office, it has been a little bit more difficult uh, to, to, to be polite. Uh, I've also requested uh, a discussion with the Home Secretary and myself uh, to, uh, to, to discuss these matters in, a bit, uh, in, in more detail, I think probably more feasible once technical notices have been published. But uh, the lack of, of, of detail uh, and, and the lack of meaningful engagement is, is, is worrying, but um, we're seeing some positive signs, uh, I hope, uh, coming, com coming forward from what the Secretary of State had to say, but clearly we'll judge him on, 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 on action as opposed to, to simply words. Shona Supplementary. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, the Cabinet Secretary just mentioned the, the technical notices. Um, have you had sight of any of those technical notices to date? And, if not, when would you expect, or do you expect, to have sight of them, and, and if so, when? Because clearly the, the detail uh, is very important, not least. Um, we, the, the, the David Mundell had said, which is something I don't think any of us could disagree with, I'm not going to suggest that not reaching an agreement on uh, that would be anything other than suboptimal. I think we could all agree on that. But the, the detail um, contained in the technical notices which are being produced or in the process of being produced, I guess that's very important that uh, you would have sight of those um, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a mixed bag is, is, is uh, how I can best describe it. So um, a technical notice on uh, civil judicial uh, cooperation uh, was shared on a confidential basis uh, between officials and, and a matter uh, obviously for the UK government, so I, I can't disclose uh, in, in, in any of the details. Um, I understand, obviously, the Secretary of State said that he would uh, write to the committee with further, inf further information. Uh, on other matters, uh, again, it's been a bit more difficult, particularly on issues uh, that, that, that we've been dealing with with, with the Home Office. Uh, in terms of um, when did we see those uh, that, that detail and, and, and so on and so forth, um, the level of engagement uh, that we have now on, on, on justice issues, as I say, is, is, is a mixed bag, but we are certainly getting some information, it would be fair to say. It would have been helpful if that information had been shared uh, a, lot area, a lot earlier for us to be able to, to make our necessary preparations. But uh, certainly, again, I might defer slightly to my officials. Uh, I know in the, in, in the 10, 11 weeks that I've been in the role uh, that there has been some information that's been shared on technical notices, um, but uh, it's been a, a long time coming. So on the justice and security side in relation to technical notices, um, we are not sure whether Home Office is going to produce one or not. Um, the Secretary of State's evidence last week tended to suggest that there would be. Um, so the Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote to the Home Secretary to seek clarification around that and to make sure that we have sight of that um, before it is published, hopefully with a view to feeding into that. Um, but we haven't seen um, we haven't seen a justice and security uh, technical notice. I understand there'll be one on firearms, um, which is a slightly different issue, but on the sort of issues that we are discussing um, today, uh, we as yet don't know whether there is one or not. And I think it'd be helpful for us to know if there's a response forthcoming um, from the Home Secretary and what that is. Per per perhaps I might just um, draw the committee's attention to the technical note and of course the question is whether the technical note is the same as a technical notice um, but the technical note which the Secretary of State um, sent to the committee with its letter on security law enforcement and criminal justice um, which does set out quite a lot of information in the particular field uh, and the question is, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary and Ms Hamilton have observed is whether there's another, no another document yet to come or, or, or not. A technical notice is a, a formal uh, procedure, and whereas a technical note could be an, just a, a, a note that has been um, an interpretation, I guess. Is that the... Um, as I understand it, the technical note um, that the Lord Advocate is referring to was um, from May 2018, and that was a, a document that the UK government produced 
um, in order to discuss these issues with the European Union. So that um, was not shared uh, with us uh, in advance. The technical notices that, uh, that I think um, you're referring to are around this suite of uh, documents that the UK is, is publishing in relation to a no deal Brexit to sort of inform the public around um, issues and, and to ensure a uh, readiness as far as possible. Um, so I, 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 um, I think there is some uh, helpful information in that technical note from me um, and there is more detail in uh, this documentation that the Scottish Government has published as well. Certainly, the Secretary of State has undertaken to come back to the committee with further information. If we feel that there's something missing in that, there's the opportunity to go back again and request further information. John Finney. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, panel. Uh, I'd like to ask questions about the Court of Justice and, in particular, the important role of uh, dispute resolution. Now, Lord Advocate, you, you referred, if I noted to collect this saying, it's a particularly effective regime, as, as things stand at the moment. Now, the White Paper states that the role of the European Court of Justice will come to an end. But it also recognises that where the UK participates in an EU agency, that the court is the ultimate legal authority on EU rules. Um, the Scottish Government uh, paper argues that the UK's opposition to the jurisdiction of the court of justice could result in, I quote here, a loss of vital cross-border cooperation and information sharing and other criminal justice cooperation measures. So I'd be grateful if you could both give me your views and particularly the compromise regarding any UK involvement in EU institutions and where do you think this squares with the position expressed by the UK government of taking back control? Um, well, I, I'm going to um, uh, treat any um, political comment as, 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 as something for others to uh, engage in. Perhaps I could make this point about the, where the Court of Justice sits in relation to criminal justice cooperation. Um, um, uh, instruments like the European Arrest Warrant, um, European Information uh, Order, um, um, the, the, these depend on mutual trust and confidence between the different jurisdictions. Um, that mutual trust and confidence um, in terms of the um, jurisprudence of the Luxembourg Court is uh, 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 is built on the, the fact that the, all the member states are signed up to a common legal regime, including a Charter of Fundamental Rights and a legal regime that's ultimately um, supervised by the, the Court of Justice to maintain consistency across the across the system. So within the context of the EU, there's a sort of integrity to the um, uh, way this fits, fits together. Um, uh, the question that I think will, will need to be addressed in the context of the negotiation of a future um, uh, security arrangement is, um, uh, the, is whether or not we can sign up to a similar uh, suite of legal arrangements uh, w without that, um, without the Court of Justice play, playing a role. Now, ultimately, that's a matter for political negotiation and a question of, of uh, red lines on each side. And you know, that's not really ultimately for me uh, to, 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 to comment on, other than to express the, the hope that on no side, uh, on no side will um, uh, those involved in negotiation um, uh, lose sight of the practical imperative, practical imperative, not to let artificial constraints get in the way of, uh, of um, putting in place a regime that maintains our capabilities. Uh, to, to, uh, to, too far apart in terms of our, our belief in this. Uh, from a Scottish government perspective, you know, we welcome uh, the, the, the courts, uh, European Court of Justice uh, jurisdiction in whatever form uh, is considered uh, necessary on, on all these matters in order to secure and uh, maintain as close a relationship as possible uh, with the EU and justice and, and, and security uh, matters. I should also say that I welcome any evolution in the UK government's position from where it began initially uh, to that really hard, hard Brexit to a slight shifting of the sands and the line in the sand to, to, to what um, Theresa May has and uh, the Prime Minister has in her uh, Chequers plan. But there's no doubt that what is in that Chequers plan, and it doesn't go as far as the Scottish Government would like it to go by, by any stretch, but even that small movement has clearly caused ruptures within, and ruptures within 
the 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 the, the Conservative Party, uh, and there may well be pressure. I would hope that she would not, and the Prime Minister would not cave into that pressure to go to to go backwards uh, on that. In terms of taking back control, I, I, to be honest, I don't think there's there's much for me uh, to say. I think it's it's, it's self-evident. I think uh, you know, in, in this world that we live in, where we are interdependent uh, and and uh, we rely on close cooperation with our neighbours, our partners, and allies that uh, to, to be 100% in control uh, without any mutual cooperation is certainly not an isolationist approach that I would welcome by any stretch uh, of the, the imagination. So uh, I welcome any movement towards our position in relation to, to, to uh, uh, the, the, the European Court's uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and I hope there's just no rolling back uh, on that. Well, it may be balanced. Um straining to be balanced, but let me say that, uh, for instance, the Secretary of State um, expressed the view that by choosing to m permit reference to the Court of Justice, the UK was maintaining control. But can I ask in relation to a specific factor, and that is that the rules would not give rights to individuals, that that challenge could only be made in the UK courts, and perhaps uh, maybe the Cabinet Secretary can express a view on whether the EU would accept that given that individuals can be subject to criminal penalties. Yeah, I mean, you're right in, in, in essence in, in what you say. I mean, the Secretary of State has stated, and I quote, any reference to the Court of Justice would be made by our choice, end quote. Uh, I mean, that's generally the case now. I mean, so far as references are concerned in terms of EU law, uh, any UK court may uh, make a reference and only the final Court of Appeal must make uh, a reference. Uh, so what remains unclear is the extent to which uh, the UK government will accept the uh, authoritative interpretation of EU law uh, by, by, by the court. So, uh, you know, that, that kind of deals with the, the taking back a con con control point. But, uh, you know, for me, uh, as I say, it really comes down, and this will undoubtedly come down to the uh, debate, putting it politely, that we're seeing between those who want as hard a Brexit uh, as possible and those that I would say take a more pragmatic uh, view uh, and, 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 and those that are pushing for that hard uh, Brexit, uh, that ideologically hard Brexit, uh, that isolationist Brexit, um, you know, they, they, they will just uh, not accept any uh, jurisdiction of the Court of Justice of, of the European Union. Uh, and if we want to be a nation that trades globally, uh, that, 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 that is outward looking, then I just cannot see how you would square that circle. Okay, thank you very much. Ian MacArthur. Good morning, um, panel. Just following up on, on this issue briefly before I turn to the issue of data sharing, I pursued the, the matter with um, the Secretary of State last week and was intrigued by this notion of, of, um, uh, of, of choice and volition in, in cases that were referred. And it seemed to apply to the areas covered by a kind of common rule book. I'd perhaps be interested, Lord Advocate, in your view about the likelihood of the Court of Justice um, uh, or our European uh, Union partners signing up to a regime where the European Court of Justice had this oversight but there was no clarity around how sanctions would apply and how the, the verdict of that court would then be treated. I mean, it seems to me inconceivable that the Court of Justice would um, allow itself to be used in a way that was... Um, perhaps symbolic or, or, or superficial, that there would have to be a ma meaningful um, involvement and oversight over those areas of common, uh, common rule. Is that, is that not fair? I, th I think there are maybe a couple of um, points. One is there, there has to be a system which um, uh, uh, you know, ultimately decides what the, what the rules mean. Now, if we... If we, in, if we, if and insofar as we simply um, continue to participate in the set of rules that already exist, then, almost, well, by definition, we will continue to be um, part of the EU legal regime, and it will be the Court of Justice that will ultimately decide what that means. And a good illustration of, of, of that is what's going to happen during the so-called transition period, assuming that we have a withdrawal agreement along the lines of the one that uh, ha has been published. Um, during that period, we will continue to be subject to the rules of the EU, 
uh, and, that, uh, and we will continue, therefore, to be subject to the um, uh, interpretation that the Court of Justice uh, makes of those rules. Um, although during that period we won't in fact have uh, any uh, British judges uh, or, or, or on, that, on that court. And that's uh, perhaps an illustration of how if you want to be part of, um, you know, part of a regime of rules, then you, 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 you're going to be um, affected by the way that the court whose job it is to interpret that rules um, I I interprets them, uh, whether we're actually um, directly involved in the court by way of having judges there or, or, or not. In terms of the future security um, partnership, well, that's, you know, that's yet to be negotiated. Um, I, 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 I don't think it would be right for me to, to speculate about, about where the respective positions or potential positions of the UK and the EU would, would ultimately leave that at that, um, uh, the question of dispute resolution. It seems, it, it, you know, it will be essential that there is some form, form of dispute resolution when we're dealing in this context as we are with the rights of individuals. Um, it seems um, likely that there would need to be some form of judicial dispute resolution. But what that will look like, um, I, I, I think it wouldn't be right for me to try and anticipate or speculate on. I mean, turning to the issue of data sharing, I think you've both acknowledged um, in, in earlier comments that there is a, a degree of mutual interest here on, on both sides, perhaps more so than there are in, in other areas where negotiations are, are taking place at the moment. Um, what does that lead you to conclude in terms of um, any arrangement around the sharing of data, which is absolutely critical to the um, cooperation um, between uh, police forces, etc. Um, assuming that what is in place at the moment cannot maintain, for the reasons I think the Cabinet Secretary outlined earlier, an alternative arrangement that is considerably more than any third party country has at the moment um, would uh, would clearly be necessary, but do you have a view as to what that would look like? Is there is there something um, that can be lent upon um, to, to inform the committee, the wider public, about how how that uh, that, that new arrangement might be made to work? Well, in terms of what it would look like, I suppose um, at, you know, as at today, we start from where we are and a set of. Um, um, arrangements for the exchange of data, good example being the Schengen Information System 2, which is a system of alerts um, uh, which um, helps to underpin the arrest warrant uh, uh, system. So, you know, it, it, you know, if one starts from where we are, one would envisage, one would want to um, have continuing access for our law enforcement agencies to those um, um, uh, systems of data um, which um, will provide them with useful information in the context of, of, um, of, of their work uh, and which are two ways. So the Schengen information system, um, um, if, 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 if we issue an arrest warrant for uh, someone whom we want returned to Scotland um, and that person is picked up in another EU country, the Schengen information system is the alert which alerts the police officer in whatever country it is that this is someone who's wanted uh, uh, under an arrest warrant um, back in the UK and Scotland, and, and you know, it, it, that's how it, it ties together. Of course, it, it's anticipated that this is an area where there may be developments. The, the various databases that are available may, um, uh, you know, may work differently or more effectively in the future, and we, we would um, want to have access to those. Um, so, so, again, it's not, in a sense, for me to speculate, but I, 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 I don't, one doesn't necessarily have to anticipate a whole new set of databases. It's, it's access to the systems and arrangements that the EU has in place already. But, 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 but I suppose the, the, the point that underlines that is that um, there, are, there is EU law about the transfer of data to third countries um, and um, you know, any arrangement that we have in place for access to these databases will have to 
from the one would anticipate from the EU perspective to comply with the EU's requirements in relation to the transfer of data um, um, outside the EU. Um, uh, and that will require us and the UK is recognised that this is a cross-cutting issue, that that will require the UK to maintain a data protection regime which is, um, uh, meets the EU's uh, requirements for the transfer of data outside the EU. I, mean, I understand that the UK put forward some proposals about how this might work. The, the, the response from um, uh, Mr Barnier or from the, the uh, uh, EU side was, um, was not wholly um, uh, in encouraging, but presumably that's around the rules in relation to data sharing as opposed to the Schengen Alert system, which presumably both sides agree would be um, a, a, a sensible basis on which to maintain a relationship post-Brexit. Post I mean, if I can come in, as we know, data protection is, is a reserve uh, matter, but you're absolutely right. In fact, even the, the white paper itself, UK government's white paper, acknowledged that there's no or very, very limited precedent for non-Schengen third countries to participate in data exchange so by their own acknowledgement. Uh, and you're absolutely right that the, the, the noises uh, are not particularly uh, encouraging uh, from the EU side uh, either. And that is uh, undoubtedly because there isn't an existing uh, third country precedent um, uh, to, that, that's necessarily helpful in this regard, uh, but also because of the legislation uh, and, and laws and rules. And I just wanted to come to the second part of your first question, uh, which was around um, arrangements that might exist for, for, for other countries uh, outside of the EU and, and so on and so forth. And there will be other fallbacks or precedents in terms of justice and home affairs measures. But again, I go back to my point that they are not as swift, not as efficient. Um, they, they, they are more cumbersome and more onerous than what we currently have at the moment. And, and if I give the example of, of, I keep coming back to the European arrest warrant, but if I give that example of, of the agreement that, that Iceland and Norway have, which is often referred to, um, that is, uh, first of all, uh, deficient in the sense that um, a number of countries, I think Lord Advocate mentioned this, a number of countries, uh, they will not extradite their own nationals under these treaties, but also uh, when these arrangements were made, they were made in 2006 and they've still yet to come into force. My point in using those examples, and I know we're talking about data exchange, uh, is that whatever we do, there is going to be complexity that will take uh, a lot of time and whatever measures are put in place, as good as they may well be, um, they will be deficient in comparison to what we currently have. I mean, I perhaps should have prefaced my remarks by um, uh, making absolutely clear that I need no convincing whatsoever that the, 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 the vote in 2016 was an act of self-harm um, unparalleled in recent times. Uh, but nevertheless, given where we are, um, and given that this is an area of, of such crucial importance, but where there does appear to be uh, a level of, of, of mutual interest in trying to maintain as smooth a transition and ongoing relationship as possible, and where, as an exiting EU member state, the UK is in a position unlike any of the third parties um, that have been uh, referred to in terms of the relationship. Is there a way of envisaging an entirely separate, unique and bespoke third party relationship that may not deliver all of the, the benefits? I fully ac accept that, but which maintain um, a number of the most significant and, and, and can be developed perhaps over time. As Lord Advocates pointed out, this is a dynamic process where the rules, whatever they're uh, agreed now, will evolve over, over time. But I go back to that Lord Advocates, uh, Lord Advocates point that was well made, our ability, even if we have that in place, which I, again, I also hope so, um, our ability to, to, to contribute to that as it develops and evolves will undoubtedly be extremely limited. And we know how quickly technology in particular moves and systems and ICT systems and everything else moves uh, at a pace. Our ability to influence that will be extraordinarily limited. Uh, before we go on to explain the new, the, the no deal scenario, Jenny, you had some questions, European arrest warrant and new agencies in Europol. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, just with regard to the European arrest warrant specifically, Cabinet Secretary, you spoke in your opening statement about the swiftness of the EAW, um, for example, in arresting someone within five hours. Um, and you also said in response to Liam MacArthur just there that Norway's perhaps closest, I suppose, in terms of non-membership and security cooperation, but we know that it is not a full participant in Europol. Um, it doesn't have access to all EU databases and it has a much more complex extradition agreement. Um, 
therefore, is there any opportunity or is there any, you know, extradition agreement which could be as effective as the European arrest warrant, in your view? Uh, not, not, not as effective, uh, I don't believe. And uh, as I keep making the point, and I reiterate again, uh, any arrangement that we do have will be uh, it will be deficient in comparison to what we currently have, and, and that can be seen time again and in, in, in case again, example after example. And it's fair to say, I mean, um, my belief very strongly uh, is that um, you know, if we have anything, uh, which inevitably we will, any measures, uh, any structure, any governance, uh, any mechanisms that are, are more are, are deficient in comparison to what we currently have, whether that's for European arrest warrants or Europol or Eurojust or ECRIS, anything, uh, then then the, the only peoples that will, the peoples that will benefit from that will be those that are trying to evade uh, justice. But I don't know if Laura Vick wants to... Yes, I, I've got um, a certain amount of very direct practical experience of, of um, conducting extradition proceedings um, under what's called Part two, which is the bit of the Extradition Act which deals with non-arrest warrant extraditions. And of course, I'm now responsible uh, as Lord Advocate for um, representing requesting states um, from around the world who want to extradite from, uh, fr from the UK and also dealing with uh, our own requests uh, to, 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 to other countries um, with, with the help of Helen and her uh, staff. Um, and, um, Part two arrests, uh, part two extraditions are significantly more cumbersome than um, uh, extradition under using the arrest warrant. Um, I, I saw somewhere, I don't know when, what, uh, precisely what data set was being looked at, but uh, a, 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 a statement that the average time for the execution of a European arrest warrant is 42 days and the average time for a part two extradition is between nine and ten months which gives some illustration of the of the difference and the, the reason why they operate differently is that the arrest warrant is is uh, built on a effectively a system of, of uh, mutual trust and confidence and is an entirely judicial process where if you've got a warrant issued by the relevant authority in another member state the working assumption is that that uh, will be be executed um, uh, subject to to, 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 to a set of um, protections for uh, uh, suspects. So we've got relative speed uh, with the arrest warrant, relative simplicity. Um, and in this context, speed is important. It, you know, justice benefits if people are brought to trial in the right forum um, uh, within uh, a reasonable time, whether they're acquitted or, or, or convicted. Um, so there's a, a very marked practical difference between the two uh, procedures. The other really important practical difference is that um, the arrest warrant is plugged into the SIS2 system. So it, it sits alongside this system of alerts, which means that if we issue an arrest warrant for a suspect whom we want for trial in Scotland, um, they may be picked up uh, very quickly through the operation of the SIS2 system. Um, a, a good example is, the, is Marek Harchar, the uh, man who was accused and ultimately convicted of the murder of Moira Jones, who uh, w w we issued an arrest warrant and he was picked up very quickly in his home country of Slovakia uh, following the issue of the, uh, of the arrest warrant and ultimately returned for, for trial. Um, and while there are alert systems through Interpol, they are... Uh, uh, they are um, uh, uh, alerts don't go up onto the system as quickly as they do through the, the SIS2 uh, system. Um, in moving from the current regime to um, uh, under the arrest warrant to, to an alternative, um, we, we're working on the basis that we can fall back on the European Council Convention on Extradition, um, which is a treaty arrangement which applies to a number, quite a number of countries that are not in the EU and which sit under, uh, under part two. Um, there are some um, uh, technical issues that will have to be uh, resolved. Um, some member states, um, as I understand, have repealed their domestic legislation which would allow them to rely on the 1957 Council of Europe Convention vis-a-vis -vis the UK. Um, so, you know, that's an issue that will need to be worked through and resolved. Um, uh, the other difference is that um, 
uh, under the arrest warrant system, um, member states are obliged to extradite um, in accordance with the system, regardless of whether the person wanted is, is uh, a national of that country or not. Outside the arrest warrant system, and we see it even in the transition arrangements that are envisaged, um, a number of countries within the EU will not extradite their own nationals. Um, Germany, for example, I understand is a constitutional bar to extraditing its own nationals, but that's trumped by the arrest warrant. Um, I go back to Marek Harchar. Um, I understand Slovakia is a country w which will not normally extradite its own nationals. Um, and so outside the arrest warrant system, um, uh, the, 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 a question would have arisen about whether we would have been able to secure the extradition of, of, of that individual. Um, um, and I suppose the ultimate, um, one of the concerns is that because the arrest warrant system um, um, is relatively speedy, operates according to um, timetables that are laid down, um, that uh, there is a risk that our extradition requests, if they're made outside that system, um, will not be treated with the same priority as those that sit within the system. So there are a set of, of um, detriments um, that from a professional criminal justice perspective one can see if we're having to operate outside the arrest warrant system. Thank you. Um, okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, there is at least the possibility of a, a no-deal scenario uh, and the Cabinet Secretary talked in an opening statement about planning being underway for a no deal. Uh, and Lord Advocate, you talked about practical arrangements being in place. Uh, so it rather begs the question, what, uh, or can you tell us what practical contingency planning have you done? Or has the Scottish Government done for this scenario? And given the Cabinet Secretary's point about how explicit the uh, EU has been throughout this, uh, when did that contingency planning start? I'll give you as much detail as I, I possibly can, and obviously if you want me to supplement that, I'd write to the convener uh, and to the committee uh, wider. Uh, in terms of uh, our own position, obviously we, we, you, he knows very well our position in relation to Scotland and, and not wishing to leave the EU, and regrettable that we're even in a position to have to think about contingency for, for, for a no-deal uh, scenario, but that notwithstanding, um, he'll be aware that, of course, Mr Russell made a statement to Parliament in June setting out the, the Scottish Government's planning for all exit scenarios, which, of course, uh, involves contingency planning uh, for a no-deal scenario. And some of that has been made, made, made difficult because we've already talked about some of the lack of, 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 of clear information that has been provided to us. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we've been doing what we possibly can. So let me give some examples of how we've been preparing for that uh, no-deal scenario. First and foremost, it's been important for us to identify where legislative deficiencies would occur within the, the, the justice portfolio upon leaving uh, the EU. So we're pri pri prioritising preparing legislation which is absolutely necessary uh, to, to, to amend in the event of an ordeal. And again, I can revert back to the committee with, with more detail in due course uh, when this legislation uh, comes forward. Now, that also involves discussions with the UK government uh, as, as, as well as internally within the Scottish government. We also then, of course, are liaising with a number of agencies uh, and, and bodies, um, such as Police Scotland, to assist them with workforce planning uh, in the event of an ordeal uh, to help them prepare for... for uh, EU exit. There's a number of regular meetings to discuss uh, that contingency planning. Uh, obviously, also um, uh, that, 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 that very much is, is, is also focused on, an, on, a, on a possible no deal uh, scenario uh, as well. Uh, in terms of our, our own readiness um, within the justice portfolio, we've recruited extra staff. Uh, we have now the Justice and Safer Communities EU hub. Um, he'll know of the Justice Board, which brings together the stakeholders, the experts uh, in, in the justice field. Uh, we now have a sub-board uh, of the Justice Board, so when he's asking about that kind of practical action, uh, we also have the, the, the sub-board of the Justice Board, uh, which again is looking at uh, readiness and planning for, for, for Brexit, which of course includes uh, a no-deal uh, scenario. Um, a number of engagements with, with, with the UK government and, and other devolved uh, administrations uh, in, in that regard, right from a civil service level, where we have a director's group right the way through to he knows some of the ministerial forums that uh, exist uh, to, to discuss uh, this issue uh, as well. So there's a whole load of, of practical measures uh, that, are, that are taking place, right from, as I say, identifying the appropriate legislation that would be deficient upon EU exit, 
uh, right the way through to some very practical measures uh, for a number of justice organisations, from Police Scotland to the Crown Office and, and, and anybody in between, uh, that they, they will have to, to think about. And that is very much uh, underway and has been underway for, for, for a, a period of time now. So uh, just if you could answer specifically uh, when that planning actually started for no deal, uh, because you mentioned June of this year, but one would assume that that has been going on for some time. Uh, but then, Cabinet Secretary, are you able to say, uh, do you, does the Scottish Government intend to publish the planning uh, for no deal such that uh, the various agencies can prepare? And if so, when? On, on, on his um, uh, question of when pre preparations for no deal, so I think all of us around this table, regardless of where we sit on the Brexit debate, would have found that no deal scenario unfathomable. But as we've all witnessed and we've all noticed, there has been a, a undoubtedly some uh, talking up of, of, of the possibility of that scenario. So uh, my understanding is that in June, uh, that preparation began for a no deal scenario. So other contingency measures... Uh, undoubtedly discussed uh, before then, but certainly the no deal scenario uh, since then. But that wouldn't have stopped um, other justice agencies and bodies, for example, exploring that specific no deal uh, scenario uh, before then. But I think uh, doing some of the the, the, the more uh, uh, so, so some of the, the more detailed work on that uh, has been since since June. Uh, in terms of um, publishing, uh, I suppose I'll say a couple of things. Uh, he had the Secretary of State, the member of the Secretary of State for, for Scotland in front of his committee last week, and he mentioned that they would be publishing certain technical notices. It would be impossible for us to publish all of the detail on all of these matters if some of it relies on the information that we await from the UK government on areas, for example, like the EAW, the European Arrest Warrant, extradition, these are reserve matters. So in order to do that, we would we would have to wait uh, for those gaps to be filled from, from the UK government and, and the technical notices. I suppose the other thing I would say is that um, I don't want to preempt Mr Russell's statement, which is scheduled to take place uh, later on uh, in the Parliament. Uh, he'll be touching upon contingency planning, the potential publishing of, of, of information. Uh, what I will do from, from my perspective and certainly from my portfolio, that when the committee asks me for uh, particular information, that as much detail as I can give on that, uh, I, I will absolutely give on, on what is appropriate. If there are contingencies, or what you've talked about, various contingencies are having to be made, are you able to say... It, it sounds as though what I'm hearing is that the planning actually commenced fairly recently uh, and is very much a, a fluid process, uh, in which case, presumably, there is no way to tell, or it, plans have not been made to quantify the spend that is required... Uh, to, to address these practicalities. And if that's right, in any event, who is expected to fund these practical contingencies? Will that be the agencies in question, or would it be the Scottish Government? The Government would not expect to, to uh, meet a, pay a penny towards uh, meeting the costs related to, to EU exit. Uh, Scotland must uh, have its fair share of any UK Government resources to support uh, EU exit preparatory work, and then that's important. And, and, and some of that will, will, of course, come out depending on, 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 on the deal. In some respects, it's absolutely right, of course, it is fluid depending on what type of deal we end up getting. But what we're talking about specifically here is on the worst case scenario, that no deal uh, scenario. So we can make some preparations absolutely for that, but undoubtedly some of that relies on what comes forward from the UK government in relation to the technical notices uh, they, they, they publish. Right then, Cabinet Secretary, that it, it, effectively we have known for some time that there could be a no deal scenario in six, seven, eight months, uh, which would have a cost attached to various agencies within Scotland. Uh, but the Scottish Government does not have a, a concrete plan for how much that cost to each agency might be, but simply asserts that the UK Government should meet whatever that cost is. Is that the, am I summarising the position? Uh, no, I mean, the position absolutely is that we're in uh, this situation uh, because of the UK government that is, of course, negotiating uh, on, on, on our behalf. Uh, and uh, the preparations for a no-deal scenario, uh, whatever costs come out of that, we would expect those costs to be met by the UK government in terms of preparatory work for an EU exit. All of us around this... 
me interrupting. It's a genuine in in intervention. Uh, presumably, you've made those representations to the UK government. Certainly. Uh, and said, we anticipate that the, the cost of no deal will be this. Uh, what do you propose in... So, uh, my, my, my point I was coming to, and I, I think I made it in the first answer, was that so much, or some of this certainly relies on the UK government coming forward with more detailed information. They are, for example, responsible for extradition when it comes to uh, and other uh, legislative matters. So uh, we can give some detail, and, and of course we share that with the UK government, and we have, as I said, a relatively uh, good dialogue with the Ministry of Justice, not necessarily with the Home Office. So we can give some information on that, but clearly we're awaiting some of the detailed information also from the UK government. I think, did you want to come in? Or? Yes, I'm I, sure I, um, I, I was just going to ask the, if the Crown Office had, had made any estimate uh, of the, well, the cost. The well, I, well, I was going to make an observation about uh, the, 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 the no-deal scenario, which, um, uh, like the Cabinet Secretary, I think is, uh, we, we all agree is, is, is um, uh, 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 not, not, not the desired outcome. Um, the effect of a no-deal is that we effectively drop out of the existing set of arrangements for cooperation. So a significant part of the contingency planning is around um, identifying what alternative systems um, and legal instruments that are already in place that we could fall back on. Um, in which the extradition, the Council of Europe 1957 convention. Now, the issue there um, uh, in using that convention rather than the arrest warrant system um, is, um, it, 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 it is that it is slower, more cumbersome, um, uh, and so on. Um, it's, a, it's a detriment in terms of the effectiveness of the system. Um, and when we fall out of the exchange of information, again, it's a, the, the key, def, key detriments are around the effect on the overall effectiveness of the system. So um, contingency planning has been looking carefully at what the extent to which there are alternative uh, arrangements that are already in place. Um, and um, as the Cabinet Secretary has observed, when we're dealing with areas like extradition, we're dealing essentially with reserved areas, which are for the United Kingdom government to, to deal with. And Crown Office, my, my, my officials in the Crown Office have been, um, a, a, as, as have uh, officials from Scottish government, um, involved in contingency planning within the Home Office's Judicial Cooperation Board um, in, in relation to to, 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 to these matters. Um, and part of the contingency is also about uh, looking at what um, legislative steps may be necessary in order to deal with um, the consequences of a no deal. And that's um, work that is, is ongoing. Um, in, term, in terms of, in terms of uh, resource, um, I said in... Um, uh, early on in this, the session, um, I, I made the point that I'm applying a small part of the additional funding that Scottish Government has made available to me in year um, to uh, additional resource to support uh, Helen and the other members of her staff who deal with this work. And that's in anticipation of the potential for additional work, particularly um, it, um, particularly work in engaging with our counterparts, uh, both um, enhancing our existing uh, good relations with, with our counterparts and other member states, but also um, in relation to individual cases where there may be a need for um, a more intensive discussion with counterparts for cases which may straddle the, the boundary. And with, with in mind the possibility that there will be additional work um, uh, on an ongoing basis. Just briefly ask, I know the Cabinet Secretary wants to come back in, uh, but very briefly, when did the Crown Office start planning for a no-deal Brexit? Uh, and will you be publishing that, those conclusions at any point? Well, we, I mean, we have had um, in mind for um, uh, some time the range of, of options. Um, 
and, and, and um, uh, Crown Office officials have been part of the UK's um, uh, contingency planning since the um, uh, 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 beginning of the year. Oh, yeah. Beginning of the year. Um, and you know, that, uh, as I understand, has covered the, the range of, of, um, of um, uh, possible scenarios. It, it's, it's, it is the case that the, uh, over the past period, um, there's been an intensity of interest or, or focus on the no deal uh, scenario, um, uh, as we progress through, through, through this year. Cabinet Secretary, you just wanted very, to come in and we've got yeah, two supplementaries. Convener, I'm conscious of, of, of time. Just two very brief points, because I think Liam Kerr asking the question uh, very genuinely to get some reassurance for uh, those involved in the justice sector. And the reassurance I can hopefully give um, is, is that as Scottish ministers, we take very seriously our responsibilities. So we're very much ensuring that, that resources are allocated to, to meet priority areas of expenditure, mm -hmm. monitoring where there's sufficient for the challenges ahead. And, and, and hopefully we can give, uh, and, uh, hopefully if we get the information coming from the UK government would be able to, to, to certainly give more detail and more reassurance uh, around the preparation for funding consequentials to portfolios, which will be confirmed as part of the autumn budget revision, uh, which is expected to be laid before Parliament uh, before the end of this month. Um, and, 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 of course, more details on that will be made uh, available shortly. But just worth also making this latter point um, that the UK government departments are only now getting to the point of costing no deal. So, um, you know, as, as Lord Advocate says, the, the, the no deal scenario, it has really only been a matter of months and this has become a, a, a real possibility um, that, we're, that we're starting to, 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 to see. But hopefully that gives some element of reassurance. Uh, and uh, it's not in any sense to seek to shift um, uh, uh, responsibility to make the point that in this area, um, you know, uh, first of all, the question of the... Um, Negotiation with the EU is a matter for the UK government, and therefore, the, uh, as it were, the the, the focus uh, in terms of contingency planning um, for us in in an area which is, um, in the context of extradition, a reserved area, uh, is very much um, uh, our focus, which uh, in which we depend on the Home Office um, uh, for uh, the approach that, 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 that that's been taken. Commentaries, Rona and Shona. Thank you, Convener. Um, just following briefly on that theme, the Secretary of State said that the UK government had done a gap analysis um, in the event of an ODO. Um, was that shared with the Scottish government? To my officials, I'm not entirely sure. Not in any great detail. So what we have is um, ongoing... Um, ongoing work with uh, Home Office in particular on my side, where we have a judicial cooperation board that the Lord Advocate talked about. So that is to um, get to Mr Kerr's point about contingency planning for no deal breaks. It started on a range of different um, potential Brexits, but now is focusing um, more heavily on a no deal Brexit. Um, have we seen um, huge details about gap analysis? Uh, no, we haven't. What we have is an increasing um, amount of information made available but not the full um, the, the full analysis and data I suspect that Home Office have. So we are working quite hard to try to tally up as much as we can um, to try to ensure that for our planning purposes, for example, um, in terms of a no deal um, impact on Europol, the Scottish Government has no control in those negotiations around what a no deal Brexit might look like and what ultimately what those arrangements may be. So we need to work closely with Home Office to try to get that information to then make sure that we are and Police Scotland are in as good a position as possible and that's where costing and things come in. So there's a whole load of work going on um, and we are getting ourselves in um, as strong as a position as possible. But that information flow from Home Office, both in terms of the analysis that they are doing, but also feeding back what's happening at EU level in terms of those negotiations is crucial for us to be able to do that. Presumably more detailed analysis would help the Absolutely. Scottish Government make contingency plans. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, really just, just on that point, that I think any reasonable person listening to this evidence session 
would really conclude that whether it's the Scottish Government or any any other uh, body it is trying to plan contingency um, arrangements against a, a backdrop of various possible outcomes and that's incredibly difficult to do and the Lord Advocate has gone into the one issue uh, which I think is a um, examples of the, the, the extradition so if um, the European ar uh, arrest warrant goes would we be operating under part two with a, a longer time frame uh, and what are, if any, the financial implications of that for Crown Office or for Police Scotland? Um, and I think without knowing that, frankly, and without knowing um, what the, the Home Office assessment of the implications for um, the, the English system, it's very, very difficult to then plan the detailed costs around that one issue and that one possible outcome. Um, so I guess what would be helpful for this committee is that when more detailed costings begin to emerge, emerge from UK uh, departments, that we would be able to get sight of as much of that information um, in terms of what does that then allow the Scottish Government to do in terms of detailed um, scenario planning for any additional costs for Police Scotland or for the, the courts um, that may emerge from extradition, and to take one example. I'm sure we can obviously furnish the committee, um, and I'll look to furnish the committee with as much detail uh, as we can, but um, you know, not too much to add. I think Shona Robinson captures it uh, absolutely right. that it, We do not know what the deal is going to be upon withdrawal, and therefore we have to plan on a number of scenarios, from the worst case scenario almost backwards. Uh, and that could, uh, on just one issue like the European arrest warrant, raises a number of other issues, let alone looking at civil law and other aspects of criminal law and legislative deficiencies and so on. But yes, I'd be happy to furnish the committee with any additional information uh, as and when we can. John Finney. Well, thank you, um, <coughs> Kavina. Um, Lord Advocate and the Cabinet Secretary, we talk a lot about the criminal law. Can, can, can I move on to some civil law and the important issue of family law, um, which maybe isn't as high profile, but can have a, a big impact on individuals, and particularly with regard to, to cross-border cases where there, <coughs> excuse me, as regards EU rules, there'd be issues around jurisdiction, recognition, and indeed enforcement. Now, the, the committee held a round table session and they, the, uh, on this particular subject, and the main options that seemed to come out were replicating the EU rules in domestic law, um, and that would uh, require negotiation with the EU and would provide a uh, still maintain a role for the Court of Justice. The other option, um, and the one favoured by the UK government, was a bespoke deal, or the third option was relying on the default rules of the uh, national law and the various Hague Conventions, which I'm sure we're going to come back to later again in this session. Can I ask for your views on the possible impact of Brexit on family law, and particular, if I may, with regard to ongoing cases and the certainty around people maybe even wanting to initiate procedures, and that would obviously bring in transitional arrangements. What's discussions, if any, there's been around that, please? Well, it's not actually <coughs> um, uh, um, within my portfolio of responsibility. Um, so I, I think the questions really have to be directed to the okay, Cabinet okay. Secretary. I was uh, more deferring to your giant legal brain. Uh, I, I, but, uh, I obviously have an interest in the legal issues. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, from, from our perspective, I'm, I'm, I think uh, uh, yeah, I'm here as head of the system of prosecution and um, you know, speak, speak very much from that perspective. So from, from our perspective, uh, and I watched, uh, sorry, read over the transcript of the evidence session that you, that you held, and I found it very interesting. Uh, as tends to happen when you have a number of academics, uh, you tend to get a, a more, more opinions than there are academics necessarily, but it was really interesting uh, to, to read over. And uh, my understanding is that you have various fallback positions, as you've rightly talked about. You've got the Hague Conventions, uh, for example. You've got uh, uh, Brussels uh, 2A, uh, Brussels uh, 1A and so on and so forth uh, as well. And uh, there are real life everyday issues. If I go back to kind of Daniel Johnson's point around um, just bringing it back to, to, to the kind of everyday, there are some real questions to ask around things like, for example, maintenance regulations which cease to apply after Brexit. So th th there is a, a Hague Convention, but there are deficiencies or, or seem to be deficiencies within that. Some of that came out in the the evidence session uh, that, 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 that you held uh, as well. So I think on, on, on a whole host of uh, family issues, yes, there are other fallbacks. 
th there's no doubt, and some of those were explored uh, in your evidence session, but uh, there are uh, clearly uh, matters that would have to be uh, uh, bottomed out uh, in relation to those. And c c can I ask, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, clearly they'll form part of ongoing discussions with the, the, the UK government as well? Uh, again, un und undoubtedly, and I forgot I didn't answer your, your point about <coughs> cross-border uh, jurisdiction. It goes back to our previous discussions. We'd obviously have to, to, to rely on mutual recognition and, and, and reciprocity. Uh, uh, I can never get that word. Uh, mutual uh, recognition, uh, most certainly. So that, that's really, really important uh, to highlight because for each of the uh, EU member states, there may well be constitutional differences there that again have to be ironed out um, before we uh, uh, before we're able to, to, to get to an issue uh, to get to, to bottom out jurisdiction the Scottish government recognized that for for many individuals in our constituencies because we're a very multicultural and people coming from indeed subsequently returning to different jurisdictions that will cause great uncertainty for a number of people uh, yes uh, I don't doubt that uh, for a minute and uh, you know there are again many kind of case studies that, that I could give of uh, where there are where there have been issues uh, in relation to to, uh, to the cases that have affected us uh, here uh, in, in, in Scotland. I've got uh, one case example here of a mother in, in, in Hungary, two children be receiving child maintenance from the children's father <coughs> in accordance with an order for child support made by the Hungarian courts. However, the father re re relocated to Glasgow where he stopped paying maintenance. Uh, the mother submitted an application under the maintenance regulation to the Hungarian Central Authority uh, that helped her to complete the requisite forms and transmitted the application to the Scottish uh, Central Authority. Um, they then identified the Sheriff Court, whose jurisdiction the father lived in, sent the Hungarian court order for registration in the maintenance register, thus facilitating enforcement of the order here. So absolutely right that this affects, if I looked at the city uh, where I belong and, and, and where I have a constituency and represent, then there's one, just one example uh, of how, with the mechanisms that we have in place, we were able to ensure uh, that uh, although uh, that, that, that a, a mother uh, got the support that she needed for her child, even though the father had relocated to, 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 to Glasgow. So, yes, many, many more re examples of that right across constituencies from the south to the north to the east to the west. So that would work in reverse too, had it been a, a, a Scottish order with yes, Hungary. Yes, I imagine so. Thank you, Cabinet. So can I also talk, touch then with the, the issue of civil and commercial law and the importance, there are a lot of discussion around trade and the, the, the agreements that underpin that for individual businesses. And it's largely, the options are largely that I, I outlined before with the addition of the Lugano Treaty, which is a, a treaty between the EU and EFTA. It, are you able to talk about the implications for, for businesses and uh, what, what practical impact this could have, uh, the uncertainty that we yeah, have. It's hugely, hugely important because, uh, you know, again, when it comes to dispute resolution, it's a big, big matter, of course, and, and, and big business and chapter, chapters and volumes have been, have been written uh, very much on this, that if there is no common agreement on the rule book and therefore common agreement on what happens when there are disputes, why would a business look to invest in the UK not knowing that it has a fair uh, chance if, if, if there is a dispute or agrees with the dispute mechanism, whereas it could invest in other parts of the EU, it could invest in parts of the EU uh, and absolutely know what the rule book is, know that it has uh, an independent arbiter uh, in, in, in the European court. So there is that element of it, the uncertainty for business. I mean, oh, whatever the uncertainty is, business doesn't like uh, it. I suppose the other part of it that we, we, we haven't talked too much about, and I didn't see too much in, in transcripts with, with other uh, uh, organisations uh, or, or indeed individuals, was consumer protection, which is hugely important uh, as well. There could be a profound impact on uh, many aspects and many rights and freedoms that consumers take for granted. For example, you know, booking holidays in, in EU countries may become more expensive, more bureaucratic, lack of mobile roaming charges may no longer be guaranteed, and we know the issues around movements of, of, of goods and services uh, could, could limit uh, the access or indeed increase the cost of a range of services from financial products to energy supply to food and drink. So there is the business side of things, which um, uh, as I highlighted just one example when it comes to jurisdiction of, of, of courts, and then, then there is the consumer aspect of it uh, as well, which I think could be... Could be uh, Undoubtedly damaged, uh, and, 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 and I suspect Mr. Russell will, will, um, 
we'll, we'll go on this in the Parliament. Uh, is already, uh, he's already mentioned that there does not have to be a choice between, you know, the hardest of hard Brexits as being pushed by by, by some, um, and the Prime Minister's checkers plan. Uh, there is, and the Scottish Government continues to maintain there is a sensible and pragmatic uh, way forward that uh, we have proposed. And can I ask them with regard, because people would understand that there might be new arrangements under a different regime, but the transitional arrangements are very important um, as regards any ongoing case. What, what, what would the position be for that, for, a, a, for instance, a business that's in dispute and is unlikely to resolve that dispute within the next 200 days? I don't have detail on that from the UK government on, on, on what a transitional uh, arrangement uh, would look like. And, and that is why the need for clarity is so, so important. Uh, and, and, and as Liam Kerr referred to, time on that is, is relatively short. And business, yeah, we know, does not like uncertainty. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not in the position to give them that certainty because it's very much relying on information from, from the UK government. So um, yeah, it could have a profound uh, economic uh, impact. I have no doubt about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Daniel. Um, so I'd just like to ask a, a, a couple of brief questions about uh, intergovernmental work. Um, firstly, uh, I mean, it's, well, more broadly, it's, it's very clear that intergovernmental cooperation is, is uh, vital uh, and key to whatever arrangement you arrive at being successful. You did mention uh, in your, one of your previous answers, Cabinet Secretary, that, that, that uh, cooperation and communication with the Ministry of Justice was good and better than the Home Office. I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that and just highlight what those issues have been and, and how you seek to improve that relationship with the Home Office. I hope the member won't mind if I defer slightly to my, my, my officials in respect that uh, I've been in the, the, the role for, for uh, you know, a number of months. Uh, and uh, although I, I've uh, sat down with them and discussed with them, uh, it's clear that there's a pattern uh, emerging whereby uh, the Ministry of Justice communication flow is certainly better than the Home Office. Now, what I've done uh, when, I've, when I've been told of that, of course, is to seek to redress that. So I've, I've written to the Home Secretary. Of course, I'll keep the committee informed of a uh, response that I, I I'll get from the Home Secretary and hopefully any conversations that I have. Excuse me with the Home Secretary, but I thought the Lord Advocate in his previous answer highlighted why um, effective and meaningful engagement with the Home Office is so, so important because of uh, matters around uh, extradition and so on and so forth. But I, I don't know if my officials are Linda, yep. so I want to come in on. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, Gavin can speak to the Ministry of Justice. Um, I'll speak to Home Office. So I think, um, I think we have had to work quite hard to be included in some of the planning arrangements. So that has now happened, certainly in terms of the Judicial Cooperation Board. I think where we have found it quite difficult is where publications have happened around security. So I talked earlier about a, 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 a technical note, and there have been other things around um, withdrawal agreements, future partnership papers, um, possible framework uh, slides that have been published that we have had little or no um, input into. Um, so what has been very critical for us, certainly in the justice and security sphere, is to make sure that Scotland's separate legal system is factored into that wider um, publication, wider negotiations, that things that are bespoke and special to Scotland that have developed over hundreds of years are protected and, and, and promoted in negotiations. Now, that has been... Um, you know, my team and I have done that over the last two years, have effectively tried to ensure that, um, that, that the Scottish system is, is adequately... Um, represented and I think the cabinet secretary referenced earlier that the white paper now has a um, mention of Scotland's separate um, system for the first time and I think we are we do have better uh, cooperation with home office than we have had the officials there are definitely working with us um, as you know in terms of their political authorizing environment but there have been times when documents have been published that we just haven't seen or have, have not had the opportunity to feed into. Um, so what we are trying to do is to work with um, the UK government and also ensure um, that we are, as, where possible, facilitating communication between our operational partners as well within those fora to make sure that their views um, are also represented in those discussions. 
Um, but I'll pass over to Gavin, who can talk a bit more about the Ministry of Justice. Yeah, I think maybe in contrast to Home Officers, I can't speak to at all. Um, our relationship with the Ministry of Justice has been relatively, relatively productive, um, and we've built reasonably good contacts with officials there and built good working relationships. There is an issue about uh, when we get notification of, of issue, uh, documents that are to be published and so on. I can't speak to whether that is as a consequence mm. of late decisions being made. Um, in Whitehall or not. Um, the, the, our main role in, is ensuring accuracy and that ensuring Scotland is accurately represented in publication. Um, we don't often uh, cast value judgments over you know, political uh, uh, issue, uh, documents that they're, they're going to publish. But um, really, we welcome good contact between officials in Whitehall and we hope it leads to better understanding um, for the public. Well, thank you very much. I think that provides a sort of a, a, a degree of clarity and illustration that's very helpful. Uh, moving on from that, uh, I mean, it's clear that uh, any uh, arrangements, any treaty that's entered into, is clearly not going to be a, 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 a final destination. And therefore, it's a, a situation and relationship that will evolve. And therefore, the establishment of robust uh, intergovernmental frameworks between the Scottish Government and the UK Government are, are, are vital uh, so that those relationships can develop. I was just wondering if the Scottish Government had a view as to what features those, those frameworks should have, how they should work, and, and indeed bearing in mind the, the, the experiences that we, we've just heard about are, are, are clearly going to be instructive towards that. Uh, initial thoughts from, from myself and, and the portfolio have been that um, you, uh, Daniel Johnson will, will, will remember, of course, the agreement reached at um, uh, JMC EN in May this year. Uh, the agreement was that there would be an intensification of engagement at both ministerial uh, level and, of course, uh, amongst officials. But it cannot be that all engagement is done from the department to, to exit the EU or cabinet office. We need experts, frankly, talking to, 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 to experts, particularly in the justice domain, where main aspects of this are uh, devolved. Uh, many aspects of this are devolved, and the UK government needs to ensure it, uh, as I say, understands the difference of our legal system and the independence of a law advocate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, my understanding is that the Home Office are now putting in place some senior steering groups. Um, and expert groups to deliver some of these expert exchanges. If that is successful, then I'd hope uh, that the next time when I come in front of a committee, I could be very positive. But that is the kind of steps we need to see where it is being led by, by, by as I say, experts right the way through from um, the government level to officials and outside bodies engaging between uh, on a UK and, and Scottish level. Uh, in terms of um, um, common frameworks uh, as well, uh, from, from our perspective, uh, you know, I am, uh, I should say, encouraged by, by what I heard from the Secretary of State from Scotland uh, last week, uh, but I would be keen to just see some more detail on, on some of that. Uh, I mean, are there any proactive steps the Scottish Government could take in terms of articulating what its view, in terms of the, the, the important or key features of any future uh, common framework on, on justice matters? understand that uh, when I say that we have not been shy in giving our opinion on, on how robust those uh, mechanisms need to be, how they need to be more meaningful. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we always ha we haven't had uh, necessarily the, the, the reciprocal feedback from, from the UK government or willingness to, to engage at level that we would like to engage them in. But as I mentioned, there, there have been some positives, and it would be trollish not to acknowledge uh, some of those, uh, some of that progress uh, that has been made in some warm words, uh, I thought, from the Secretary of State for Scotland. And, and uh, uh, of course, when you make those warm words, they are in, in, in the record forevermore. So I will look to, to follow up on that uh, with the Secretary of State and with, with other UK government. But yes, certainly we have not been shy in coming forward. And some of the measures that we now see are because of, and, and you know, it's not just the Scottish government, we should be fair to the Welsh government uh, and indeed. Um, um, officials from, from, from Northern Ireland uh, have also been engaged in the process too. That concludes our line of questioning. It remains me to thank the Cabinet Secretary, the Lord Advocate and their officials for attending. We'll now suspend to allow the witnesses to leave and for a five minute comfort break.
Agenda item four is consideration of two negative instruments. These are Legal Aid Employment of Solicitor Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018, SSI 2018 Oblique 193, and Share of Court Amendment Order 2018, SSI 2018 Oblique 194. I refer members to paper two, which is a note by the clerk. Do members have any comments on these instruments? Liam Kerr. With both together? Yes. Uh, nothing substantive, but simply on the sheriff court fees one, uh, it seems to be quite, that, that's quite a major um, error that, that somebody seems to have made somewhere along the way. And going back to a point that I think Jenny might have made, it, somebody made the point about these briefings, uh, but that it, I, I guess I, I'm curious to understand how did the error come about? Like, who's missed the uh, omission of the carve-out in the original legislation? Because if that was this committee or this parliament, then that would be concerning, and clearly we need something that would have flagged it up, uh, or we need to change our processes so that we're seeing that. And if it wasn't us, how, how confident can we be that whichever agency it was is going to pick this sort of thing up in the future? Uh, I think the short answer is we don't know, but we can write and get that additional information because, as you say, it is important that we don't just rubber stamp these things and say, OK, there's been an mission. It would be good to find out exactly how that had occurred. And if that was the case, we could delay actually approving the Sheriff Court Amendment SSI today, get further information and uh, take it from there. May I just come back on, on that? I think that's sensible uh, and I would feel much more comfortable if I knew what I was putting my name to sort of thing. Uh, in terms of delaying, is this not the one that says this needs to change the, to get the, the carve out in as soon as possible because of the potential ramifications? Yeah. Well, we've got to 24th of September, so it would allow us still to take, take it again next week without unduly affecting anything. John Finney. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. I have no, no issue with what's been proposed, but, you know, mistakes happen and, and lots of jobs, things happen, and it's to understand that uh, it's not a procedural fault, I think it's fine, but the important thing is the mistake's been picked up, and this is what we're dealing with now. So. Yeah. Lee McCarthy. Thanks. I mean, John makes a, a fair point. My, my concern is that um, in the context of what we've just been discussing uh, in, in relation to Brexit, this is a parliament that is going to have a considerable volume of statutory instruments coming before it. And I think what this does is, is highlight um, uh, very appositely um, some of the risks that are attendant on that. And, and um, I think with my corporate body hat on, um, I will reflect that back to, to, to colleagues. But we need to find a way of trying to ensure that as we're dealing with fairly uh, weighty, substantive and, and complex issues, uh, that we limit the scope. I mean, John, John's right, um, uh, errors may, may arise, but we absolutely need to have confidence as we go through this process. It's as robust as it possibly can be. That being the case, then, is it the committee's um, feeling that we want to write and just get an explanation. Mistakes do happen, but as Liam MacArthur said, we're going to be dealing with an awful lot of legislation that's coming up, and if we've got questions and additional questions as a result of that, then it's going to be a very um, complex and needlessly complex um, uh, transaction and um, activity that we're going to be undertaking. So we can write ask for a full explanation. I don't think there's any uh, harm in doing that. It won't affect the timing of anything and bring it back for approval next week. Are members agreed to do that with Can I just ask, the Sheriff yeah, Court? Would that affect the SSI? I mean, if we get an explanation? No. So is there any point in delaying it, really? Because it's not. this isn't going to change, but we will get an explanation. We'll get an explanation. I think it was really to underline the point that if we keep just rubber stamping these things, then sooner or later we're, we're going to, to, to reach, um, or the possibility is we could reach a mistake that is going to, to cause a huge delay when we know there are so many SSIs going to be coming to this committee and other committees as a result of the, the Brexit set, uh, settlement. So I suppose it's just making a point that um, we really need to know why these things happen. If it's human error, okay, it does, but uh, we can accept that. But 
you know, we may learn something from it. And I think we definitely are making a very definite statement here. John, John Finney. I wouldn't want the term rubber stamp misunderstood. I think we scrutinise everything yeah. that comes before us and, and the decision taken would have been taken in good faith at that time. So, is the committee agreed that we'll ask for an explanation, bring it back next week and um, take it from there, from that Sheriff Court order? Agreed? Agreed, okay. In that case, in terms of Legal Aid Employment Solicitors um, Scotland Amendment regulations, are the committee content that we make no recommendation in... Um, in respect of that instrument. Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you for that. We now move into private session. Um, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 18th September, when we have our first evidence session on post legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. We now move into private session. <laughs>